This week, Andrew and I celebrated 21 years of marriage, and you would think I would have it all figured out by now, but I've got to confess, yesterday I made Andrea cry. And she cried, and she cried, and she cried. You say, what do you do, Pastor Matt? Well, this year, our jalapenos in our garden were extra spicy. <laughs> And, I mean, I don't know what we did, but these things will light you on fire. I mean, usually we can eat a jalapeno, just pop it in our mouth and eat it and not be a problem. We love spicy food. But I stopped eating them about a week ago. And uh, yesterday, Andrew's kind of like, no, we grew them, I'm going to eat them. <laughs> and so I'm watching Andrew, Andrew put some of those on our food and, and I look over, a man just full stream of tears. Her lips are swollen. Her face is red. I don't know. So I made Andrea cry yesterday. <laughs> but actually, this has been a glorious season uh, this past week or so because our garden and your gardens are becoming completely ripe. And we're eating the spinach salads grown in our garden and the corn on the cob. Um, we're eating all these wonderful vegetables, the green beans, the peas, the fresh herbs. We're seeing all these things just come, and, and tomatoes. Can you say BLT? I mean, just, and we had BLTs for lunch. She said, what do you want for dinner? I said, BLTs. <laughs> and um, just those, those, those Indiana tomatoes, the best thing in the world. And um, our garden did pretty good this year. And... Uh, you know, it, it, made, it reminded me of a childhood memory, and I want to talk about that a little bit today in our message. If you're a Soul Harvest veteran, if you've been here for five years or more, you've heard me talk about this one other time um, as far as a message. I'm going to change the message, but use the same story, the background story. And the story and the title of our message today is called Manure Happens, or Manure. And uh, <laughs> so the story goes like this. When I was a kid... Um, through some parent situation, I had to go live with my grandparents on a farm at age 13. My grandfather was so excited that I came to live with him. I thought because he wanted to spend time and take me fishing and, and, and have all sorts of you know, quality grandfather, grandson time, and some of that did occur, but he was more excited about free labor. <laughs> and so when I arrived, there was uh, a barn, and we, we had a racehorse farm, and uh, our, our particular barns had uh, the horses that were either on break or yearlings or um, just take, for whatever reason not actively racing. And we had about 13, 14 horses and a barn. And, and those horses uh, could add up a pretty good cartload of manure pretty quick in that barn. And these horses, um, one of the reasons why I don't like horses um, <laughs> One, I, I like horses, but I would never own a horse. Let's just say that. Uh, horses tend to be territorial and where they do their business. And they like to do it in the same spot over and over and over. And for whatever reason, these horses decided they like to do their business in their food trough. <laughs> and that meant as a feeder of horses, I had to clean out their food trough on a daily basis and the pitchforks and the food troughs were designed without this in mind, and using pitchforks and shovels didn't quite get it all, and there was only one way to get it out. I dealt with a lot of manure as a kid. When I got there, because of my grandfather's health, uh, the barn had not been cleaned out in several months. And so when I got there, my grandfather gave me a manure spreader and a pitchfork and said, here you go, Harvard. And uh, so I worked, it was a one-ton new idea manure spreader hooked up to the back of a Massey Ferguson tractor for all those of you who are farmer folk. And, uh, and I worked, and I mean, it felt like that manure was almost knee deep. And <laughs> I shoveled and pitchforked and shoveled and pitchforked. And, and you realize this stuff has been staying there for months on end, and then the horses walk on it and trample it down. So it's, it's just nasty, let's just say that. And I shoveled and shoveled. This was before the days of Bob, or well, we didn't have a bobcat. We didn't have a tractor. We had a kid. And so shovel, shovel, shovel. So I fill up this one-ton spreader, 
it would fill up multiple times that season. But I asked Grandpa, where do you want me to dump the manure? And he said, put it on the garden. Well, we had two gardens that were about the size of this sanctuary. Um, and so I took a, about a ton a piece, a ton of manure went on each. I spread it out over those gardens, planted the garden that year. And that year, when it came about this season of the year, you go out to our garden, huge strawberries, huge tomatoes, the sweetest, biggest corn on the cob you've ever seen. It was the best garden we had ever had. And even to, in my memory, of course, sometimes your memory makes things better than they were, but even to my memory, I don't ever remember seeing a garden that full and that delicious and, and the vegetables that big is that year when I poured manure, manure, manure onto that garden. Now, that being said, turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. <clears throat> and I want to read to you the parable of the sower. And let's look at verse 14 through 20. The sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground also. When they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. In the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones, ones sown on good ground. Those who bear, hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. Some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And Jesus giving a parable here, he actually gave the parable earlier. The disciples didn't get it, so he had to explain it here. I gave you the explained version. Bottom line, as a sower sows, a farmer sows seed, some of it fell on different types of soil. And the different type of soil determined the yield that each crop or each ground would have. The soil condition affected the harvest. Just like today or back then, back when I was 13, 14 years old, by preparing the soil, it produced a great harvest. You know, even in our garden today, of all things I've struggled with growing in Indiana since I've lived here, the hardest thing for me to grow has been sweet corn. <laughs> okay, I get a witness. Well, someone finally told me, Pastor Matt, the, probably your soil is nitrogen poor. You need to put some nitrogen on your soil, and you'll get better sweet corn. Well, this year I was going to just not do any sweet corn. I said, I'll give it one more shot. And so I only planted four rows, and I put some nitrogen on there. Actually, Bill Akers, who's sick today, gave me some nitrogen to put on it. So I put some nitrogen on the sweet corn. And lo and behold, it came up about twice as big as it was last year. And the ears are almost twice as big. We'll probably get our first ears over the next week or two. Now, it's still by no means great sweet corn. Next year, I will double the nitrogen. But at least I'm finding out, you know what? I have to work the soil to be able to work the harvest. And as Jesus is teaching this parable, he's not so much concerned. I'm sure he is concerned about the yield for your beans and your corn. But more importantly, he's concerned about the heart and he relates the soil to the heart of humanity, to each of our hearts, and the condition of our hearts is going to have a great deal with the fruitfulness and the effectiveness of what we are able to do and be in the kingdom of God. The conclusion I'd like to give you from that is, even in this day and age, our, our Indiana farmers spend a lot of money and a great deal of care and concern with their soil. 
If they buy a new field, they don't go immediately and start sowing into that field. They go, they begin to do soil tests. They say, okay, what's the nitrogen? What's this? What's that? What, how deep is the soil? What do we need to do? And before they look at, making, at trying to just plant seed, they will sometimes spend thousands and thousands of dollars to make that field, that soil. They'll put drainage pipe in. They'll put, uh, they'll, they'll put different fertilizers on it. They'll till it. They'll plow it. They're going to do a lot. Why? Because they know the soil affects the output. Jesus says your heart is like the soil, and the, our hearts affect our outputs. There was a little boy, and he saw a farmer, and he, the farmer had a truckload of cow manure, and he was putting it on strawberries. And the little boy says to the farmer, he says, why, why, what, what are you doing? Well, the farmer says, well, I'm putting this manure on strawberries. And the little boy said, well, I don't know about you, but where we're from, we put whipped cream on strawberries. <laughs> There's going to be some things in life that are like manure. There's a lot of manure that you're going to go through in life. And when, it's going, when you're going through it, it feels a lot like manure. It feels like the devil's like that horse that wants to go poo-poo where it's the least convenient place in your whole barn. And you're going to have to get it on you. When you shovel manure, you're going to smell like manure. When you shovel manure, it's going to get on your boots. And when you shovel it long enough, it's going to get on your hands, it's going to get on your clothes. You're, it's not a pretty job. And in this life, you're going to go through it. There's all sorts of different manures that God, there's different fertilizers that our farmers use. There's different manures that God uses in your life. And at the time, it feels terrible. Oh, God! But God is the ultimate farmer. And he's trying to get the ultimate yield out of your life. That you would produce fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. And sometimes the things that feel stinky and nasty to us, God's up in heaven saying, yeah, it's stinky and nasty, but I'm doing this because I have a greater plan than just what you're going through today. There's three types of manure I was going to talk about today. I'll get to one today. The manure of problems and trials and tribulations. Every single one of us, if you've been alive for more than a couple years, you're going to have seen trials, tribulations, and problems. It is a fact of life. You're going to go through it. And we go through different levels of trials and tribulations. I want to give you a couple scriptures, and then we'll go back and unpack it. 1 Peter 4, verses 12 and 13. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. We're going to go through problems. The Bible promises that. How, what determines the severity of a problem? What determines how big a problem is? Can I... Maybe throw a little light on that for you. Many times, the severity of the problem has to do with the strength of the person it's happening to. You know, growing up, we had kind of a rough 
family life, rough home life. And it didn't take anything to set my family off. I mean, a $50 problem could cause our family to go in a major tailspin for months. It didn't take anything. There are some folks, if your car has a $50 issue, it's going to cause you to question your faith in God. Oh dear, how am I going to make it? It feels terrible. And there's some, I'll tell you, Steve Fritz sitting here, uh, uh, Steve was having major, I think quadruple, if I'm not mistaken, bypass surgery up on the north side of Indy. <laughs> and I went to go see Steve, and he said, Preacher, what are you doing here? I, I said, I'm here to pray for you. He said, Preacher, go home. I said, what do you mean, Steve? I drove an hour to get here. He said, that's my point. You, could, you got better things to do with your time. I'm going to be fine. Well, open heart quadruple bypass didn't bother him because he knew he 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 knew where. Now I, I'm still going to come. <laughs> I probably listen to him about as much as Loretta does. <laughs> but the bottom line is, you know, when I, he he wasn't panicked, he wasn't worried, he wasn't struggling with his faith. He they had perfect peace. Open heart surgery, you know. And yet there's others that stub their toe. Pastor, 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 is God real? I stub my toe. So the, the significance of the problem has a lot to do with the strength of the person it's happening to. You know, you could be in a desert. And the proverbial, you know, you got lost in a desert and you're there for days on end without water and you're crawling through the desert. Water, water, water. And you come up and you see one of these things. Laying in the desert, this can save your life. But if you don't have the strength to open the cap, and how many of y'all know sometimes these things are boogers, right? If you don't have the strength to open this cap, the answer could be right in front of you. This, everything you need to save your life, and yet you still die of thirst because you can't open. Why? Because your strength isn't there. Your strength your fortitude determines a great deal how you react to the problems and trials and tribulations of life. Now, there's four types of problems. One, brought on by God. Two, brought on by the... I used to teach there are three types, but there's actually four. One, brought on by God. One, brought on by the devil. One, brought on by yourself. And one, it's just life. I added that one. Because there's some things, it's not you, it's not God, it's not the devil, it's just life. There are machines that are going to break down, things are going to go wrong, someone's going to pull out in front of you, you're going to get, you know, have you ever driven somewhere and gotten every single red light? You know, that's not the devil trying to manipulate the system, that's just you were in a bad traffic pattern. Abraham. Well, I need to skip that part. Let me give you six quick keys as we finish to turn a trial or a problem into fruit. Number one, know the source. If you, as you pray, you feel the trial you're in is brought on by God, hold fast and obey. If you feel the trial you're in, the problem you're in is brought on by the devil, rebuke that sucker. Send him back to hell. Say, get it. I rebuke you, I resist you, and you have to flee and take all your problems with it. If you feel like it's something you created yourself, repent. Ask God's forgiveness. Ask God's help. And if you're like me, you've had to do that more than once. And not every time I made Andrew cry, it was because of jalapenos. You know. And if it's life, Use your faith and rise above it. I saw a cool thing the other day. It said the eagle catching a snake. When it comes and gets the snake, it doesn't go to the ground and fight the snake. It grabs the snake and takes that snake up to its, where it fights, up in the sky. And you know, when you're dealing with a snake of life, 
Don't fight it on the ground. Get up to the sky and fight that thing. So, how to beat this thing. Number one, find out the source. If it's you, repent and move on. Number two, don't quit. Don't grow weary while you're doing good, for you will reap in due season if you don't faint, if you don't lose heart. You're closer than you think. Don't quit just to find your victory was over the next ridge. Florence Chadwick, 1952, trying to swim from the Catalina Island to California. She had been swimming 15 hours in the water, and she was getting tired. She was growing weary. She was trying to set a record, and she said, I got to quit. They said, no, keep going. She said, no, I got to quit. They said, keep going. She finally said, pull me out of the water. A deep fog had settled in. She couldn't see. They pulled her out of the water a half mile from the shore. True story. If she could have seen all she had to do, just a few more strokes, and she was there. But she quit a half mile early because she couldn't see where she was going. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a fog that tries to come in. When we get surrounded by problems, when we get surrounded by trials and tribulations and circumstances, even if the things we brought on ourselves, let me tell you, there's a fog that tries to set in to take away our vision, and it tries to say things like, oh, you're never going to make it. It's too hard. Just go ahead and pull back. And the devil tries to confuse you and tries to blind you from the truth is that your victory is just over the next ridge and you keep pushing on. And when you've done all to stand, you stand there for. Number three, keep your confession. What do you mean? Life and death are in the power of the tongue. This is one of those, if I had a dollar moments, or even a dime, if I had a dime for every time a Christian prays one thing and says another, I'd be a wealthy person. Don't talk yourself out of God's blessing in your life. You know, don't, can, can I tell you, use your tongue to speak life, not death, over your circumstances, over your family. Don't go, Lord, I pray for my husband. I pray he comes to know Christ. I pray my husband becomes the priest of our home. I pray my husband this, my husband that. Yeah, you would never believe what he did today. What did you do? You just spoke against what you're praying for. What's the Bible say, James? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways and can expect to receive nothing from God. Our confession, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Lord, I pray, oh God, you provide my need. Lord, our rent's due this next month. The mortgage is due next month. Lord, we're a little short. We need your help in Jesus' name. Well, I just don't know how we're going to make it. I don't know what we're going to do. Which should God believe, your prayer or your conversation? You want to turn your trials and tribulations and problems into victories. Let your confession be strong. Number four, do it God's way. Just because you're going through a problem doesn't mean you should pull back from the things of God. Okay, I've seen people do this. They, 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 hit, a, they hit a wall. They hit a financial wall. They, they hit a marriage wall. They hit some type of a wall, and, and they say, because we're at this wall, we're going to stop doing it God's way. No, that's when you press in to do it God's way. That's when, that's when you say, you know what, we're, we're going to follow God's plan regardless of what we're going through. You see, we don't allow problems, we don't allow circumstances, we don't allow things of this world to dictate how we serve God. We serve God how we serve God based on the word of God because that's who we are because we're full of God. We do what we do because of what we are. Problems and trials and tribulations, they don't affect your faith, they reveal your faith. When you're going through the difficult stuff, you see, and you say, oh, well, we hit this financial wreck, we're, we're going to have to do this. Do we hit this? We're going to have to do this. No. You press on toward the mark of the high calling. Your faith does what your faith does because of what your faith is based on, not because of what's happening to you. Number five, watch your friends. When you're going through a problem, when you're going through a trial or crisis, your friends can make you or break you. Job's friends would have talked him right out of his blessing, right out of his miracle. David's friends, when David was starting to think about sinning, those closest to David did not come to David and say, David, 
Don't do that. You're about to throw your life away. They said, yeah, let us go find out information about that girl for you. Surround yourself with people who are going to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Surround yourself with the kind of people who when you pray, they're going to pray with you, and their faith is going to work. And when you start talking against what you just prayed for, they're not going to agree with you. They're going to confront you. I want the type of friends around me uh, that uh, if I ever let my mouth deceive my heart, they're not going to let that stay there. They're going to say, Pastor, you're, you've got faith there. Don't, don't, don't let your mouth deceive your heart. And number six, the answer is usually there the whole time. Can I just, I didn't have time. Oh, Lord, we got to go. All right. And it, this is one of those days, you know, we got to pray over the kids. Uh, I think y'all had to let Zach share. That was worth it. Had to, had to, um, we, every month we got to let you know where the building is. I mean, we got to cast the vision. You guys are sacrificing your life for that thing. The very least we can do is show, tell you how you're doing as a, collectively. I'm looking forward to one service. I didn't even barely touch our message today. The answer is there the whole time. We were in 2008. I met with Pastor Lowe. And back, we were at the old building. And Pastor Lowe said, I feel in prayer. You've got to start believing God for a building. I said, A building? I said, We're believing God to keep the lights on, and you want me to believe God for a building? He said, no, I'm telling you, you've got to believe God for a building. You've got to believe God to do something because that building that you're in is not going to hold what God is about to bring. You've got to believe God today. Start praying today. So back then, we started praying for a building. We started praying for God to bless us. Guess what they started building in 2008? This. Guess how many times I drove past this and didn't think a thing of it? Oh, look, a new funeral home. That's what our town needs. That's about all. As a matter of fact, uh, they sent me a letter as a pastor this, in this town. I got a letter from the owners of this when this was a funeral home. And they sent me a letter, hey, we're a new funeral home in town. We'd like to give you a tour. We'd like you to come out and meet us because you're going to be doing some funerals here at some point. And I kept a letter. I was by vocational at the time. I didn't have time on the open house. So a few months later, I had a day. I said, I, I, want, I do want to go meet these people. So I picked up that letter. I picked up the phone. I called, do, do, do. The number you have called has been disconnected. What? Crumpled it up, threw it in the trash can, didn't think a thing of it. Lord, show us the building. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. But at the appointed time, at the appointed time, I drove by, saw a real estate sign out in front of this. I drove down here. I looked at it and I said, boy, that won't happen, but sure, wouldn't that be nice someday? Turned my car around and drove off. A few months later, maybe I'll go look at that. What could it hurt? You know, when you're going through a trial, tribulation, crisis, problem, whatever you want to call it, can I tell you, the answer is there the whole time. You just have to go through the process that God has you to go through. Why? Because God's got some manure he's trying to put on the fertilizer of your heart. And we say, oh God, how can you let this happen to me? And God said, I'm so glad this is happening to you because I see the fruit of righteousness. I see the fruit of the soil of their hearts. Their hearts are changing. They're going to learn to rely on me. They're going to learn to use their faith. They're going to learn to not allow the what life does to them to happen to them to affect their faith. They're going to set their faith They're going to on the word of God. They're going to set their foreheads as flint. They're going to get stronger. They're going to get better. They're going to be my kids what I've called them to be. Praise God. Amen. Oh, I try not to get so excited, but you keep amening. You know, I try, I try sometimes, you know, I, and please don't ever turn me off because of style. I, I can't help. I just get passionate for the things of God. Please. I would rather get too passionate than sit up here. 
Our text today will be out of the book of, let me blow the dust off. All these pages are stuck together, maybe I should get in here a little more often. Our text will be Psalms 23. Let us ponder the deep truths of thy holy word. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Okay, and I'm not against that, but that's just not me. And i got to be who I am. Now, but please don't ever turn me off because of style, because what I have to say really is a good word that I feel is Holy Spirit inspired for you. All right? So, but I know, I know I'm passionate, and I try to calm down. I, today I made a very special emphasis. I'm going to be calm the whole service, and I just couldn't get through it. <laughs> It just, it, it, Jeremiah said, I tried to quit, but it was like fire shut up in my bones. <laughs> That's a so. It's kind of like the more I hold it in, the more it's going to explode. <laughs> I love you. The answer's there the whole time. Don't know what you're going through. God's got a plan. He does. It's bigger and better than what you think. He loves you. He didn't withhold his only begotten son. How much more would he freely give his children who ask in his name? He loves you very, very much. Let's pray and be dismissed.